So uh, let's warm up a little bit. Just a few uh, questions for Sophia while Jessica is adjusting. Is this better? It actually is. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Sophia, um, you want to give us some general feedback on this novel, the first third that you read? By the way, I would never wish that novel on anyone your age, or any age, but especially you. You're in. Uh, you're still in grade eight, eight. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it is, it's usually studied in grade twelve. Um, Jessica had the pleasure of reading it in grade ten, like twice, I think, right? Oh, uh, once before, once before a really long time. Yeah, we spent a couple months on it. I think. Yeah, can you can you keep that microphone where it works, or is it just uh, loose? Is it better like this way? Absolutely. Okay, so I'll just have to hold it up then. Whenever, yeah, just like a real microphone, handheld. Okay, uh, Sophia, your chance to uh, share with us what you, your general impression and thoughts. Um, I think 1984 is a pretty interest. Okay, so far it's been pretty interesting. Um, I feel like I can, even though it's written, it wasn't written in the 21st century, I feel like I can still draw some connections to modern society and yeah. Yeah. Like the That's high level technology and the lack of privacy. Yes. Draw lots of connections. Good. Um... Jessica has disappeared again. Oh, can I keep my video off? Is that okay? It's okay, but it doesn't look so good for me. It, it makes it look like uh, no one wants to be, uh, no, everyone's afraid to be seen. Oh, uh, okay, I'll turn it on. <laughs> yeah, hi. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, you probably have selfies all over the internet anyway. I really don't, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right, your friends are probably have pictures of you all over the internet. That's unfortunate. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. And you and a billion other uh, people will never find you. Um, yeah, lots of parallels. Uh, for part one, Jessica, if we're going to finish focus on part one, you've got you've got that funny light bulb, like really. Yeah, it's the ceiling light. <laughs> no no worries uh what can we talk about for part one any ideas uh we could talk about his past like how he um yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure what we can talk about, actually. Well, you already mentioned some parallels. I just wondered, uh, you know, we have, uh, sorry, if there was anything specific, uh, any themes. Uh, we're introduced to O'Brien and we're introduced to, please remind me the young lady's name. Julia. 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 <laughs> Jeez. Um, and of course, uh, Winston Smith, the protagonist, um, his, his home life, his apartment, his office life, his culture, if we can call it that, of, with Hate Week and uh, the Anti-Sex League and what else is part of his culture? Not sure. His like morning workouts or his job in general is a very big part, I guess. I feel like part one is a lot of setting the scene for what's coming after. 
with the other events. So, yeah, yeah, your your voice is fading away as your microphone is going away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, certainly he's, but I think it's not just setting, you know, setting. It's wow. Um, the technology theme is there. Um, really, just setting. Maybe there's some truth to that. It's all background before. Julia and uh, Winston gets their love affair started. Hmm. And then part three is a giant depressing conclusion to that love affair. With O'Brien too, you know, he's kind of in love with O'Brien. What was your thought? Uh, what's your impression of O'Brien? Sophia? Um, I don't really have a strong impression of him because, well, I feel like he's in a way like a conundrum because I'm pretty sure, um, also read a summary on this, but uh, I heard um, the Winst uh, Winston Smith ends up kind of believing O'Brien was a part of some underground, underground, Resistant. yeah. Yeah. He made that, uh, in, he drew that conclusion based on zero evidence. Yeah, just based on like a glance during the two minutes of daily hate. I think yeah. that's what it's called. I think so, yeah. Um, and I think uh, what he liked the way O'Brien held his glasses and I don't know, something about his uh, tough features, rough features, the wide jaw, I don't know, it didn't make any sense. So, okay, I think we can uh, discuss these points in detail, I'll draw some parallels. O'Brien and guess who? Well, all our leaders, uh, but maybe especially Trump. A lot of people think he belongs to the resistance. He's not part of the, the bad guys in the government. But guess what? Uh, he talks that way, but he does nothing. And he's probably, uh, no, he's certainly part of the government or just, sorry, certainly part of the, uh, what they call the deep state anyway. Uh, not helping anyone. Would it be too harsh to compare him to Justin Trudeau? No. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, would you like to elaborate? Why isn't it unfair to compare O'Brien to Justin? Um. So, based on like a lot of people's impression on Justin Trudeau, he seems like a nice guy because of the way he looks. Yeah. Similarly, Winston also trusts O'Brien because of the way he, he looks, in a way. Yeah, it, it is just based on looks. Uh, we don't know what O'Brien's beliefs really are. Um, but even if O'Brien were to speak, he could trick him with his words. I'm sure that would be easy too, because uh, Winston doesn't seem very intelligent. He doesn't ask questions. Uh, I think we should look carefully at uh, Winston's little letter. Sorry, his little... Diary? Pardon? His diary? His... his diary yes uh his journal yeah um and his belief that he's somehow a a genuine rebel outsider and we can discuss that a bit okay um well i'll make a little break then and and uh, introduce the show properly we'll cut out this first i don't know 14 minutes and Try to get started.
A couple of notes, yeah. Just, of course, Jessica, please remember your microphone. And Sophia, I heard some papers moving. It's not a big deal. Um, just try to keep it discreet. Okay. Um, okay, well, welcome everyone to another uh, podcast of Stop BS Now English class. Today we're discussing 1984, everyone's favorite or not, dystopia, dystopian novel by George Orwell, published 1984, no, sorry, 48, shortly after World War II. Um, this novel is often uh, reduced to a criticism of uh, the communist rev the communist uh, world, Soviet Union specifically, but uh, plenty of more perceptive and honest people have uh, recognized that this is not simply about the Soviet Union. This story has plenty of parallels to our own times. Um, and after all, he didn't name a single part of it after the Soviet Union. Um, the Soviet Union doesn't seem to have any role there. Um, Granted, Ingsoc, I think that's the government in the novel, is a socialist government, uh, at least uh, on the surface. And well, one might say Canada also has a socialist government, at least on the surface. Uh, plenty of governments claim to care about their people and in that sense are socialist. But uh, anyway, let's not concern ourselves too much with what people want to reduce this novel to and discuss all the parallels and uh, some of the interesting uh, dimensions of this novel, questions regarding this novel and its characters. Uh, we have today uh, Jessica, one of my students, Sophia, uh, also another student, uh, Jessica's in grade 10, Sophia grade 8, uh, both in the greater Toronto area. Uh, Sophia has limited knowledge of the novel, but she will contribute with part one, and uh, Jessica has had extensive experience reading and writing about this novel, driven her a bit crazy, I think. Um, I honestly wouldn't wish it on anyone, uh, although I appreciate its profound meaning for us. Very well. Uh, let's uh, begin with uh, a little discussion of uh, our main character, Winston Smith, uh, sometimes considered a hero. Um, he certainly considers himself a, a hero, a What's the word? A rebel. Jessica, what do you think about our protagonist? It seems like he thinks he's a rebel, but honestly, he's not doing much to prove that at all. So he's still playing. He writes in his diary and you can see his thoughts that show that he may not think according to the way the party wants him to think so he doesn't actually show any action to prove that as he still works really hard at his job which is to like erase and rewrite history and even though he seems like he's against that he doesn't actually show it what was your point about his job so his job itself is to erase and rewrite history and I think he knows that it's not, he's, I don't think he approves of it exactly from his experience with the. You, but you say you think he doesn't approve of it because like me, there is no point at the novel in which, at least not that I can remember, he ever criticizes his own job. <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah. Well, it's hard to uh, give up your job and to be critical of your own job when it's your only source of income and your life seems to depend on it. So I think 
the only solution for that is uh, something hinted at in Animal Farm. It's not to live like a domesticated animal, but to become one of the wild animals and uh, to take care of yourself and live closer to Mother Nature rather than be dependent on a government for handouts. You know, it's interesting in this in this novel. Uh, I don't think there's any money. What do you, am I right? Money? Is there money? Do you recall anyone using money to buy anything? Uh, I know I know Winston bought something in part two. Yeah, he bought like, um, I don't know, it was a paperweight from the antique store. I, I remember them using money. Okay, okay, I'll take that back. But there doesn't seem to be much of it around anyway. Okay, Sophia, how about you? Your, uh, your thoughts on... Uh, Winston Smith. Um, she's naive. Uh, I, I feel like he, yeah, on the inside he feels like a rebel because he um does start like a love a secret love affair that his um his government does not approve of, but he's also working in one of the ministries. So, yeah, I, I, in the end, I think he's naive. Yeah, naive because he's, he hates his government, but he works for it. Yeah. Right, so uh, that, you know, that reminds me of a, uh, an issue I have with plenty of my peers who, uh, who love to be critical of the government, of course, generally adults will be critical of their governments uh even the governments they vote for mm -hmm. and yet at the same time they will actually work for them pay their taxes and go through the same circus every four years another leader another one who doesn't seem competent who's making bad decisions and yet like good sheep we will go pay our taxes and uh, not somehow uh, envision and work towards a uh, work for a better world. Um, naive, uh, what's another word for him? Uh, I think that's probably captures most of his uh, personality, naive. Uh, are there any other are there any clues that he's not actually a hero? Anything about his body? There was a funny detail about the, uh, or odd detail about the varicose veins and him struggling up the stairs. Yeah, I remember he was described to have like a frail body, I guess, and not hey. physically fit. Wait, now wait a second. Earlier you mentioned that he's doing uh, regular exercises, workouts. Yeah, from the government. <laughs> so what does this tell us? <sighs> that it's not working. <laughs> Absolutely not working. Do you think... Uh, you can generalize here. Do physical education classes at school uh, produce healthy, uh, fit, strong students? No. No, says Sophia and Jessica. Sophia, why not? If they wanted us to be fit and healthy, I'm sure they would have incorporated more gym classes because... For every two weeks of school, I believe I only have uh, three hours of gym. Okay, Sophia, there's a lot of background noise there. I think it's from you anyway. Do you know what it was? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you would have expected more gym classes? Yes. And Go ahead. I don't really think they're teaching us to be fit and healthy. I feel like they're more uh, more so teaching us 
different sports. And yeah. Yeah, along with all the rules and maybe you get some anatomy and I don't know what. Uh, Jessica? Yeah. yeah, I guess. Um, Actually, I don't have any gym classes right now at school at all. So but I remember back in middle school, like Sophia said, it was mostly based on sports, like team sports. Yeah. And although I think that's a good thing, it didn't really help us develop ourselves physically unless because it was based on how well you participate in it. And it was really short, like the time you would actually play in a game. So right. it didn't really give you time to develop anything. Plus, right. we, mean, only, we didn't really learn about like, like specific, like what to exercise and like health. And I think you mentioned anatomy. We right. didn't really learn about that until much later on. Or nutrition. You know, maybe a good way to, to, to do a gym class would be to start with a, a reading of your blood pressure and your heart rate, and then to compare. At the end of the year, did you get your heart rate down? Is your blood pressure improved? Uh, that would be a very objective way of seeing that you made some progress with your health. Uh, in the past, we used to have tests like how many push-ups and how fast can you complete a mile. I don't think those tests exist anymore. We actually did something similar to that last year for me because we had to, we had like running exercises and then we'd have to measure our heartbeat and then compare every once, like a couple months. Okay. I think it was every two months. And then same thing, push-ups and uh, planking and all right. that fun stuff, which right. I think was actually pretty helpful. I think until... No, it was pretty helpful, but a lot of kids started slacking off, so it wasn't that good at the end. Okay, and maybe there's not enough time in gym classes to actually improve in any of those strengths. Yeah, it was because we did those tests every two months, but in our actual gym classes, we wouldn't actually like do those exercises. Uh, we would be playing games, <laughs> right? Right, so then you're not going to improve. Okay. Um, I've always been, uh, what's the word, Observe, noticed that Winston Smith's first name is the same first name of a very famous politician who lived at that time, I believe, when the book was Winston published. Winston Churchill? <laughs> Winston Churchill. Indeed. <laughs> Um, I don't think many people talk about that. It's extremely uh, brave, I suppose, to, to venture into this because Winston Churchill is still a national hero among Britons. Um, I'll just make a couple of notes on that. I don't suppose you are familiar with Winston Churchill enough to draw these analogies, sorry, parallels. Um, Winston Churchill was an amateur uh, author, actually did quite a bit of writing, and we noticed that uh, Winston Smith is also interested in writing and is an awful writer. Yeah. Uh, possibly worse than uh, the young man in Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield. Um, he considers himself a rebel. He's naive. I, I imagine uh, Churchill was also, well, not imagine, I know he was naive. Um, and he's racist. Both of them are racist. We, sh we should probably explore that. What's the evidence for that? Um, and lastly, the last point slips my mind. Um, seems to have enjoyed war. All right. Um, is Winston a racist? Is he racist? Is he sexist? Is he, is he classist? All three. 
I mean, based on the judgments he made against Julia and O'Brien, I think in the very first couple of chapters, he made judgments about who, like, what type of person they were and their personalities just based on their appearance. Yeah. Sophia, uh, what do you think? Sexist, racist, classist? Um... Yeah, I think he's sexist, but I'm not so sure for classes and races because I don't think I have enough evidence. Right. Well, let's look at uh, the diary entry provided in part one. Um, I should be able to put it on my screen for you, our screen. Let me uh, scroll down a bit. Not so easy. Uh. I think I'm almost there. There we go. All right. Um, let's see if we can find any evidence here of uh, classism or racism. And uh, brainwashing, I think there's a lot of evidence here that our good protagonist is absolutely brainwashed and corrupted by his own culture. April 4th, 1984. Last night, to the flicks. Uh, we got a couple of incomplete sentences. All war films. One very good one of a ship full of refugees being bombed somewhere in the Mediterranean. Audience, much amused by shots of a great huge fat man trying to swim away with a helicopter after him. Here's a run-on sentence. First, you saw him swallowing, sorry, wallowing along in the water like a porpoise. Then you saw him through the helicopter gun sights. Then he was full of holes and the sea around him turned pink and he sank as suddenly as though the holes had let in water. Audience shouting with laughter. Well, here he's reporting how the audience feels. How do you think he feels? Same or different? He probably feels the same. I don't think he's indicating anything otherwise. Yeah, there's no evidence that he's critical, not even really of the audience. Um, and he's watching a, a horrible film, uh, <laughs> perhaps not very unlike the movies watched nowadays, pl plenty of violence. Um, I haven't been to a theater for a few years and maybe only a handful of times in the last decade. All right, could you continue for us, Sophia? Like reading? Yes. Okay. When you sink, then you saw a lifeboat full of children with a helicopter hovering over it. There was a middle-aged woman, might have been a Jewess sitting upon and sitting up in the in the bow with a little boy about three years old in, his, in her arms. Little boy screaming with fright and hiding his head between her breasts as if he was trying to burrow right into her and the woman putting her arms around him and comforting him, although she was blue with fright herself. Okay, uh, we have a, uh, a nice little simile here. Any comments on this simile? I feel like that's what the little boy wanted to do. Yeah, but okay, this word burrow, where does it come from? Isn't it like digging a hole? Is it, is it what humans do? Humans dig, what? Who, well, I mean who? like, what are those? Those like weasels? I don't know. <laughs> Did you say weasels? Yeah, 
so I don't think that's a good animal, but to use, but um, in that situation. But you're on, you're absolutely right. It is uh, animals, they burrow. We don't usually apply that word to humans. So what is Winston doing to this child with his simile and this word choice? Is it showing? Pardon? It's... Couldn't hear you. Um, is it showing that the boy is similar to an animal, I guess, in that situation? Correct. And the, the, uh, the word you could use here is dehumanizing. <laughs> dehumanizing the boy. Okay. I'll continue. And the woman putting her arms around him and comforting him, although she was blue with fright herself all the time, covering up, covering him up as much as possible, as if she thought her arms could keep the bullets off him. As if she thought her arms could keep the bullets off him. Like, now it sounds like he's making the woman sound stupid. I don't think she, she thought her arms could actually protect him, but this is, this is instinctive reaction in an emergency situation. Um, let's see. Um, then the helicopter planted a 20 kilo bomb in among them. Terrific flash and the boat went all to matchwood. Then there was a wonderful shot of a child's arm going up, 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 right up into the air. What shows, what, what reveals his opinion about this movie here? There's a nice adjective that re identifies what his opinion really is. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful, indeed. He's absolutely corrupted. Uh, into the air, a helicopter with a camera in its nose must have followed it up, and there was a lot of applause from the party seats. But a woman down in the prole part of the house. What does prole mean? It's like the lower middle class citizens, I guess. Okay, so here perhaps we might be able to uh, speak about classism. We noticed that the pros are sitting in the lower area, or sorry, in, the, in their own section. Uh, suddenly started kicking up a fuss and shouting. They didn't utter, or shouldn't have, showed it, not in front of kids. They didn't. Ain't right, not in front of kids. It ain't until the police turned her, turned her out. I don't suppose anything happened to her. Nobody cares what the proles say. Typical prole reaction. They never. All right, Sophia, you want to try it? Yeah, that is evidence of. Okay, I, I couldn't hear you. You're uh, far away. It was evidence of classism. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, what is the evidence specifically? Talking about how the proles don't really have a say or like a, a voice in, the, uh, in this matter. Yeah, um, she should keep quiet, be obedient. Uh, <laughs> and he uses another interesting adjective, I suppose. Typical pro. This word typical is like the word interesting in English or in Canadian English, uh, or is it maybe now international English? Mm -hmm. The word interesting should be a positive word, but it's often a negative word uh, used sarcastically. What does typical mean here? It's like, oh my gosh. It's generalizing, it's generalizing the woman's reaction. It's just like all trolls act like this, like in this fussy way, I guess. 
Not your microphone. Is it, not, is it okay? Um, yeah, typical here is just generalizing, I guess, the woman's reaction, which was kicking up a fuss. It's just saying that all all pros act like that. Yeah, that's true, and that's that is the literal uh, meaning of that word: typical, normal, <laughs> general. But I think beneath that there is a uh, not a what we call a connotation instead of a denotation. He's implying that she's stupid. It's typical of them. Um, isn't that typical? So I guess we're done with that passage. Uh, any last thoughts? Okay, feel free to suggest any other uh, topic. I just noticed the fiction department. We can talk, talk about Julia, the anti-sex league. And of course, our coronavirus world. Shall we call it 2020 rather than 1984? Anything you like. Well, I think we should do something with parallels right now. Um, what parallels would you like to discuss, Sophia? You had some in mind, I think. Um, you talked about coronavirus, I think. You talked about coronavirus, I feel like um, we could draw connections. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think you saw something more specific. You mentioned um surveillance yes yeah go ahead uh, speak about that a bit uh like they don't they don't have any privacy like everything they do is like being recorded and how is that like our world well um i heard from my teacher for the coronavirus, there was one person who had coronavirus symptoms. They, they went out for like a day and the police used their Presto card to track all their locations and the time. Yeah. So they were supposed to be home. They were supposed to be home, but the police still, by using like that one card still managed to locate all their lo uh, all the places they've been to. Right. Yeah. yeah. And if you're an adult using a, a, a credit card, they can do the same with that. Um, any other connections to our own world, the surveillance world of 1984, Jessica? Um, I guess. Yeah, like the telescreens they use, which are like surveillance surveillance cameras, but also double up as entertainment or I don't know, workout videos and propaganda. Um, I guess what Sophia was saying is true. Everything is being like, I feel like everything is being digital, like put on the internet so quickly. It's like most people know where we are, anyways, or what we're doing. Yeah, because uh, there, there is surveillance going on with our secret service agencies um, and corporations who pay to get all our uh, information from Facebook and Google and whomever is willing to sell to them so that they know what we want, who we are, so that they can sell stuff to us. Um, we know that uh, the cameras in our phones and in our computers can be turned on remotely uh, without the lights going on. Um, everything we say can be recorded, uh, is saved somewhere. There are gigantic uh, buildings in, geez, where is it, uh, Utah, I think. The NSA there has 
so massive construction for sucking all the data off the internet more than they know how to analyze i think mm -hmm. um okay next topic then um any suggestions before i make the suggestion No, what was the other parallel you wanted to explore, Sophia? I think I also talked about high level technology, like the advancement of technology. Right, which is closely related to your observation that uh, surveillance uh, is coming true, that the surveillance nightmare is coming true. What about the technology? in this story i'm only familiar with the telescreens is there anything else i guess not um how is it similar to technology today i guess you mean uh it seems to be everywhere anything else sophia uh like the telescreens uh so I have a friend who told me a, about something in China where they have like video surveillance cameras that can, that's like everywhere and it can like recognize your face. And essentially if you do something good, it boosts your points, like citizen points. I'm not sure, but I feel like that's like similar to the telescreens in a way. Yeah, no, certainly it's very similar. Uh, I think there's a kind of social credit system in, in place in China now. They'll even catch you if you're crossing the street without permission from the uh, street lights. Um, I think Canada is working on introducing a similar system. Um, we already had something in place, but it never became uh, mandatory. Not yet. Um, so many things to talk about, really. Um, one way in which we could, what's the word, argue that uh, George Orwell's prophecies and vision has not come true is if we discuss perhaps uh, the state of London what does it look like in 1984? I'm not sure how much they actually described it, but from what I can like remember right now, I feel I always feel like it's some dirty place, like with a lot of like I don't know litter. I guess, although it has a lot of technology. You're right. It's, it's a bit of both. And isn't that just like our world? I mean, perhaps even out more, out, more so outside of Canada, if you were to go to uh, Africa or India, um, virtually everyone has a cell phone, uh, I believe. Um, and well, I might be stereotyping here, but uh, there are plenty of, uh, what are they called? Uh, not ghettos, but, uh, you know, lower class, dirty neighborhoods. Uh, slums? Slums, there's the, there's the word. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of those around. Now, London doesn't look the way it's described in this story. However, uh, it is a prophecy with no date on it. Well, 1984 was just a playful date, 84 being the reverse of 48. Uh, is it possible that uh, we are headed that way, that London will one day look the way it's described here and uh, Toronto as well, New York as well? What do you think? Is the coronavirus going to... Uh, destroy the economy and 
lead to the ruin of our cities? Coronavirus might destroy the economy, but I feel like on like an environmental measure, I feel like it's doing more good than bad because people are staying inside. So the amount of cars being used every day is being greatly reduced. Correct. Yeah. So there is, there is, that's a good observation. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, there's less economic activity that is good for nature. Uh, however, the cities, what could the effect on our cities be in the, in the future? What's going to happen when uh, all those restaurant owners, uh, all the people who they employed, um, all the workplaces that are shut down, uh, especially uh, people who are providing public services or non-essential services, um, when those people can't pay their rent, their mortgage, their bills, Is the government going to say here, we'll replace your income 100%? Right now, I think there, I don't know what it was, but there is some worker like thing you can apply for, which gives you, I think, obviously not 100% of your income, but a tiny bit that they think is enough. A tiny bit, yeah. Therefore, what eventually will help? What what eventually will uh, what will eventually happen to our cities if this doesn't change? Well, eventually, some people won't have enough money, and then they might not be able to pay their bills. Yeah, and well, people will start nailing boards over their restaurants. They won't expect them to open, and they won't be able to open them. Uh, and not only restaurants. Things will be nailed shut. Yeah, um, I think it was two thousand dollars a month. Yes, I think that's the maximum they're promising. Uh, I think they're even talking about little weekly uh, dribbles. Similar. Oh, yes. to, you're doing the research now. Um, no, but. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are some rents that cost more than the amount Indeed. the government's get, uh, giving out. So, uh, so this is not even a survival handout. I also heard that some like apartment buildings, or I don't know, but they're like maybe cancel. They're like reducing their rent. I think I heard that somewhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, landlords who are generous, generous, uh, sympathetic are reducing that. I think in China, actually, they uh, they mandated that all landlords forego charging uh, rent or collecting rent for one month, or maybe it was two months in Wuhan and elsewhere. Um, that's very nice for the renters, but you know we live in a system where the renters and the landlords need to survive. If landlords go broke, they don't pay their mortgages, they don't pay their bills. Um, then I guess the building becomes a, a government building eventually, if this happens on a large scale. Which brings us closer and closer to the world of 1984, where the government seems to be in charge of everything. There doesn't seem to be any private business. Very little. Of course, that man who sold the... Uh, paperweight. Um, do Julia and Julia and uh, Winston ever go to a restaurant? No, not really. <laughs> no, they don't, not ever. Uh, and that might be the future we're looking at right now too, the end of the restaurant era. Um, it seems hard to imagine, even though I uh, only have one or two restaurants in this 
vast metropolis that I visit uh, and would dare to visit, uh, there might be a handful more. Anyway, it's, it's a big change and that's where we're headed, it looks like anyhow. Um, Sophia, did you notice the, uh, the numerous uh, euphemisms in this part one? Okay. Is that a new word for you? No. Euphemisms, yes. You didn't notice them or you don't know what that word means? Like, I didn't really notice them, but I kind of noticed them, like. Yes, like the Ministry of Truth, uh, and what is the name of the apartment complex Winston lives in? Victoria Mansions? <laughs> Or Victory Mansions, I'm sorry. Even his cigarettes are named. Victory Cigarettes. Yeah. Victory for who? The government. The government. Right. Yeah. Well, that brings me back to China. Of course, China has its uh, government-run tobacco company, the world's biggest. Um, but here in Canada, of course, the government runs the... Uh, the alcohol trade, right? The LCBO and the, um, what do we call it? The beer store, at least in this province. Um, but throughout the country, I believe it's run by the government. Plenty of parallels. Uh, any other euphemisms? Any other lies? Yes. Okay. Uh, go, go ahead, Sophia. The Ing Socks three slogan. Like, I personally don't agree with it. That's why I believe it's a lie. Yeah, well, they don't seem to make much sense. Uh, <laughs> war is peace. Um, how could that make sense? Well, uh, presently we have uh, the Western world, uh, if not saying it, at least behaving as if um, gigantic military uh, buildups and just large militaries generally are, are necessary for our intelligent species. Without it, apparently, we don't know how to create peace. Um, and this seems to be a, a permanent situation. Uh, not only that, uh, some people would say we're, the world is at peace right now. We haven't had a world war since 1946, five, uh, yeah. 1945. Um, is that true? Has there not been? There have been, I think, a couple more major wars after that. And although I can't, yeah. But th there's obviously been like tensions going on elsewhere that the Western world might not know about. Yeah, that our media is not informing us about. Uh, maybe most, most notably uh, the war in Yemen. Have you seen much on the news about the war in Yemen? I know no. about major starvation there. But I don't know about the war. Yeah, well, the starvation is, has been caused by the war destroying infrastructure and international trade for that country. Um, plenty of war zones and hotspots, uh, I think, the U.S. is dropping a bomb every, I believe it's something minutes? like, pardon? Was it 12 minutes? Or? Yeah, you remember that, yeah, yeah. The, my, my handout on World War III. 
so um, undeniably there's war happening even in this so-called time of peace without a world war. Um, it's different from previous wars because different kinds of weapons are being used and um, we don't have major confrontations between uh, uh, large contingents, large uh, groups of soldiers. Everything's being done uh, kind of secretly. Uh, and if conventional weapons are used, uh, we tend not to hear about it especially if it's in Africa or um, Central Asia. We don't hear much from those zones. Okay. Um, I'm, I'll, I'm, we're going very slowly. I'm on page one again. Uh, A similar theme here. Winston seems to think he belongs to a, the middle class because he speaks about proles as if they are a different class. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about the, uh, the inner party. Uh, well, not as if, but in a, in a way that reflects that he knows they are a different class. So that leaves him in the middle in, I suppose, the middle class. Is he right? Does he belong in the middle class? What's the evidence for that? Or against it? I think he thinks that way because he has a job with the ministry, like working at the ministry di directly. Yes. Although he does mention like the proles are, I don't know, just workers that work for their entire lives and without like I don't know. I feel like he's doing the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, his his uh, residence at Victory Mansions, does it reflect the residence of a middle-class person? Does it seem like a middle-class residence? Uh, well, let's take a look. Um, chapter one, page one. Uh, it was a bright cold day in April. The clocks were striking 13. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At the end of it, a colored poster. Too large, okay, let's skip over that. Uh, and then uh, a little further ahead, uh, he made for the stairs. The elevator is not working. <laughs> What's going on? Now, where does he live? Is this comfortable middle class London? He also he also says the le like the electricity doesn't work in during like the daytime. <laughs> right. Um, and what are people eating in his environment, in his class, cabbage? Mm -hmm. what, is, what does he eat? Does he ever have a decent meal? I think bread, bread. cheap alcohol, gin. Yeah, I remember them having some like cheap substitute. I don't know if it was like fake. I think it was gin, yeah, instead of proper alcohol, I guess. Yeah, and he said the gin tasted like uh, Chinese rice wine, of course. There's a bit of a racism towards the Chinese there. Um, what else? Uh, even the plumbing doesn't work sometimes. His neighbor, he has to go fix the plumbing for her. So there's no evidence here that he's middle class. Could this situation happen to us, to a Canadian government worker in the future? I mean, it doesn't seem super far off because 
like if the electricity is cut and then we suddenly run out of food, then it's like... Right. Why might the government choose to cut electricity in the future? Because they don't have enough money. <laughs> yeah, if they're in charge of paying for everyone, if people no longer have jobs and the government has to pay everything, they might use that excuse. Any other reasons? I'm thinking about climate change. Um. Climate change is the big threat and we must use less power. So it's possible in the future they will start rationing. Um, I don't think they really care about the environment, that they'll have other reasons for rationing. Uh, maybe in order to cut off people off from their internet use, uh, to prevent people from organizing and, and work chatting to, you know, that as they're doing now, we're not allowed to meet in numbers larger than five. Um, so that means it's okay to infect four people, but not okay to infect 40. Sounds rational to you? I just wanted to reduce the number to show that they're trying to do something, like the government's trying to enforce a certain law or whatever, but we should just all be staying home in the first place. We should just stay home? I mean, that's, that should be what they're trying to say, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why they would just cut it down to five. Yeah, maybe you can clip that microphone to your hair. That would be cute. Oh my God. <laughs> um, yeah, you say the government is doing something. Uh, want to create the impression it's doing something. Uh, what do you think, Sophia? Yeah, I feel like in this situation, they don't really know what to do. So they're like putting this or like, I'm going to like use, even though it's not the Canadian government, I'm going to like use the American government as an example. I feel like Trump, he isn't really doing anything because coronavirus cases have skyrocketed in America and uh, yeah yeah all they're doing is destroying our individual freedoms don't do this don't do that don't do this stay there that's not doing anything they're they're just issuing orders making us do things how about producing more hospital beds, more masks, better medicines? And how about doing this in advance? So you're ready when it happens. We've had these virus uh, panics, these virus dramas several times over the, my lifetime, uh, probably several times in your own lifetimes. So what's the excuse the government has for not being prepared? Government has no excuse. Um, it's just not interested in preparing for these things. Now, I, wanted, I, th I think I want to uh, start winding down, but I want to wind down with the really big topic. Um, first, my own little note about uh, what happened to London <clears throat> in this novel, how it, it seems quite shut down and uh, impoverished. <clears throat> Could that happen here? Absolutely. When uh, not only if the government decides it can't pay for us, but uh, when uh, individuals can't pay, that might be enough too. And if the whole economy crashes because banks are already on the edge of bankruptcy. Um, when banks crash, uh, no one can borrow anything. Business grinds to a halt. Unfortunately, businesses are built on loans. 
uh, the housing sector crashes because no one can buy a house without borrowing money, virtually no one. And uh, so this coronavirus uh, drama could produce very staggering economic consequences. Um, and much more of this book will seem true in the near future than looks true at the present time. Uh, can we draw any parallels between the, what do they call, uh, Goldstein and the enemy, the constant war, and our own world, our own world being obsessed with currently coronavirus, uh, recently global warming, do these, do these threats, the threats of the virus and of global warming, uh, parallel the threat of war in 1984? I think that might be a big question. Tell me, is that too big to handle right now? Yeah. What's your impression of the war in 1984 and what is Winston's impression and relationship to the war? For Winston, I feel like it seems really far away. Like, like all these, there's three big powers or air, like, I don't know, countries, I don't remember, but there's yeah. three big areas that are like fighting constantly and like they're always switching sides, switching allies and then but I don't, I don't see Winston like actively being too concerned with it, although it's on, it's on the telescreens and everything. Yeah, so I mean, that's easy to parallel to our world. Most uh, Americans, especially, sorry to pick on Americans, but they do have the world's biggest war machine and they do lead most of the war uh, actions. Um, most Americans are not concerned about war and Understandably, it never comes to their shores and uh, their media doesn't report much of it. Uh, but actually, uh, not so understandably because they are at the same time paying the taxes that help fund this great war machine that they are not watching, not monitoring. Um, Yeah, maybe it's hard to draw good parallels between that war situation and uh, what we have with uh, the so-called war on climate change and now the war on the coronavirus. But I'll make a, a quick effort. Uh, Big Brother, he uh, or they, as you mentioned, uh, release conflicting information. People are not sure anymore who they're fighting, why they're fighting. Uh, there are good parallels to what happened in uh, Iraq and with ISIS and Syria. Uh, I'm not sure anyone knows anymore whether the US is supporting uh, ISIS or fighting ISIS, uh, supporting moderate rebels or fighting rebels of all kinds. And as for the coronavirus, that's a tough one. I think I can do it later. Um, wars, are, wars are historically used by governments to uh, increase their power, increase taxation. Um, I think the coronavirus is already doing the first. It might actually reduce taxation, but might actually replace the whole taxation system with a worse system, a system in which people with no income just get handouts. All right, uh, last topic, big brother. Sophia, you got a big brother? I don't have a big brother. Do you have, no, you don't have one? 
No. <laughs> well, I'm joking. That's, uh, that's lucky, I suppose. And yet, and yet we all have a big brother. What do I mean? We all have someone watching us. <laughs> yeah, and who is big brother in 1984? like the top of the government or the government itself like yeah the government generally sure uh that's a wonderful euphemism for the government big brother even government is a kind of a euphemism but do they really govern um i guess it depends on your definition of govern but they certainly are not our big brothers uh but they would like to portray themselves as being the caring, uh, watching uh, family member, as if they're trying to replace our family. Um, and I feel increasingly like I'm being treated like a little boy. Why might I feel that way? Sophia or Jessica? Well, in in the context of like the coronavirus, I guess you're being limited on a lot of your actions. Like you can't go outside, you can't do this or that. Got to wash your hands. <laughs> right, uh, and uh, it's nice if they care about me and they're trying to give me good advice. But commanding me, and even threatening me with fines and prison now. Uh, I just read an article in the Star. Uh, fines ranging from $750 to $100,000 for using parks, parks that are banned. If I can't pay it, I have the choice to go to prison for a year. This, uh, I think even such measures don't exist in, uh, well, what would they do in 1984? I guess I would just be disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, curiously, there are no children's parks in 1984. Uh, the only child we see is one cooped up indoors and going a bit batty and playing with plastic guns not unlike our own students being home and uh, well presently still enjoying not going to school but probably playing plenty of uh, video games with including first person shooter games all right uh, any closing thoughts you can just say no or maybe later uh -huh. No. Good for tonight. Let me hear a big no from Jessica. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for joining me today. I, I thought I would finish 1984 in one day. Maybe that was wishful thinking. Uh, you're both welcome to join me again on Friday as we explore part two, um, especially uh, Julia's role. Thank you again. And this is the end of uh, our podcast on 1984, the end of another Stop BS Now English Classroom. Uh, everyone uh, stay healthy and happy. Talk to you uh, next time.